Hello, and thank you for listening to this special edition of the History of World War II podcast. This episode is about my recent trip to the Military Aviation Museum in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And just like the episode I did on the D-Day Memorial, this is in an MP3 format, which includes pictures. The Military Aviation Museum is home to one of the largest private collections of World War I and World War II era military aircraft in the world. But what makes this place special is that the aircraft have been restored to their prior military condition, using original parts whenever possible. Practically all of them are airworthy and flown several times a year at various air shows. And most of the guides that work there are the actual pilots. Now that's loving your job. Now, unlike the D-Day Memorial that I covered earlier, the Military Aviation Museum does not just tell one chronological story. In fact, that's what makes it so interesting. Each piece of it, or plane, has its own story, and I'll do my best to convey as many of the stories as I can remember. So, lacking any single event to organize my description around, I'll just cover the items as I came across them. First off, the staff there was very helpful and eager to explain everything they housed. So, if you go there, and I certainly recommend it, don't hesitate to ask away. When you first walk in, a staff member, who is probably one of their pilots, is waiting there to explain the basic layout and answer any upfront questions you may have. The gift shop, though small, is well represented and just off to your left. And here's a picture of two mannequins that are to their right, dressed in era-appropriate clothing. So, I got the introduction to the museum's design and was reminded many times that practically every aircraft I would see was flyable. And it would be pointed out if it was not. So, God bless my wife, she took our girls for what I assume was a two-hour walkabout and left me alone to amuse myself. Actually, there's a dinosaur park at the entrance, so if you need that, the kids will keep themselves busy probably for hours. At least mine did. After getting my entrance ticket, the first thing I looked at was a V-1 rocket. And as there weren't many people around, the man at the entrance turned to face me and reminded me that the V-1 was flyable. It was ready to go. All it needed was fuel and, of course, explosives. That made me step back for a moment, but it was amazing to be that close to one. The Fizila V-1 flying bomb's design was approved in 1942 and first launched at London in June of 1943. It was built at the secret facilities at the Pinamunda airfield on the Baltic Sea. The engine was guided by a simple preset gyro compass, and the flight duration was controlled by simply controlling the amount of fuel on board. Simple and direct. More than 10,000 of these doodle bugs, as they were called, were launched against England with a 2,000-pound warhead, doing significant damage wherever they landed. Luckily, only about 25% of them actually hit their targets. Still, I'm sure the damage was amazing. This particular V-1 was found in a tunnel after German unification in 1989. Again, it is fully functional, and it's the only one known to retain its radio homing device. Also in that immediate area, to the left, there were several engines, and I would honestly love to tell you that I know something about these, but I don't. Still, the Rolls-Royce Merlin, pictured here, got the British through their darkest hours when sitting in Spitfires and Hurricanes. And the second one is a Pratt & Whitney used by the U.S. in their Corsairs, Hellcats, and Marauders. And I think they deserve a moment of their own, and here's a few pictures of what was in that area. Now, because of the type of person I am, when I entered the main room, I went to the left after glimpsing the V-1. But if I had gone to the right, There, in all its glory, is a replica of the Wright Brothers aircraft. The Wright model EX Vin Fizz full-scale model was built for the museum in 2003. And there's an interesting story behind the original one. In October 1910, the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst organized a contest, the prize being $50,000 and you can imagine how much that was in 1910, um, to anyone who could fly across the United States in 30 days. So soon five planes were organized and they took off, but only one made it. Yet it didn't make it in the required 30 days. 
On a side note, Cal Rogers was one of the attempting pilots, and he was being sponsored by a company that had just introduced its new grape-flavored soda. And it's been a popular drink ever since. The EX Vin Fizz had a maximum speed of 55 miles an hour. Straight back from the Wright Brothers replica is a red telephone box that you hopefully can still see on a lot of street corners in Britain. And of course, as an American, I find them extremely charming. So posted inside was a sheet from the war period letting a person know how to contact various locations. So hopefully this picture turned out. Um, then heading to the right far back corner, there were a few other items I couldn't wait to get to. First, we have a picture of a United States Army Jeep, and I was told that different units like to have different symbols on the sides um, representing them, and I guess someone decided that this awkward-looking panda would be, good, would be a good representation. Next is a German motorcycle made by BMW, and it rode three and it could uh, set a gun on top. Um, and again, there are some symbols on different sides. I think this one saw action in North Africa. Next is a British artillery piece. It's an Ordnance QF 25 pounder. Um, this again saw action in North Africa. And the piece beside it is it's limber. It held the shells for the gun. And I think three shells could fit, fit in each slot here. So that was pretty cool. And they would be connected together with something that would pull them. And so the gun, the uh, limber and whatever was pulling it would be called a train and, and they would go in groups and were organized just like everything else in the military. Next is a Humber, um, which was a four-wheel drive armored car, and they would use that either for uh, scouting or to deliver messages, that kind of thing. But it was an all-purpose vehicle, and I think the British used them in the military um, up until the early 1950s. The next one was officially called a Carden Lloyd Universal Carrier. Um, some people called them scouts. Uh, they had a small gun on top with thin armor, and they could go out ahead and scout the area before the main body, you know, find, gather intelligence, go back and tell the main group. So they were used a lot to dash around because their armor was too thin to really protect themselves um, from any serious attack. And during all this, we were encouraged not to touch anything uh, because everything, just like the planes, were in working order. And as any mechanic can tell you, you were bound to get oil on your hands. Um, next was um, almost my favorite. It was a German staff car. And it was explained to me that this was mostly to run errands, take this map to this general, see what changes wanted to be made, bring it back. But basically, it was a courier from point A to point B. And again, this saw uh, action in uh, North Africa. And you can tell by the, the paintings on the front and the back of that. So I should have pictures of both of those. And it was just really neat for me to see all these things that had actually been in North Africa since that's literally where we are in the podcast. So it was very cool. Now, at this point, we're still in the main room from when you first walk in, but know that there are hangars on each side of the building. Um, but before I went into any of those, I decided to go straight upstairs because they had some more um, items to see. Now, waiting to say hello to you as you're about to start up the stairs is Rupert, the para dummy. Uh, sorry for the bad photo here, but the light was really working against me. For comparison, uh, the British pair of dummies were just burlap sacks, but the Americans, going all out, um, those were made up from molded rubber and painted to look as lifelike as possible. The one that you see here was used in the 1962 film, The Longest Day. So that was kind of cool. The upstairs held various military instruments. Um, here you can see a U.S. Army field phone, a warning siren, um, field set telegraph, and my favorite, the walkie-talkie. There was also uh, bombardier equipment like the Sperry gyro bomb site, as well as various cameras. And these were neat to see. I hope the pictures came out well. Uh, you can see a gun camera, a reconnaissance camera, and a newsreel camera. But what shook me the most and you don't know what you're looking at until you read the sign above, there are four large poster boards, and all the poster boards have signatures of the men that fought in World War II and Korea. And I just stood there staring at the names and just tried to imagine what these men have seen and done, you know, when they were teens and they're in their 20s and 30s. It just must have been a, an incredible time, hopefully, you know, never to be repeated. Um, after walking away from these signatures, I thought I didn't, I didn't think I would see anything else that would really move me. But then I came upon something I've always been fascinated by, and it was a, an Enigma machine. And I know we haven't covered this in the podcast yet. We're getting there soon because it affects uh, what happened on Crete. Um, but when I can find a decent stopping place, 
I'll, I'll stop and back up and do the, the history of the Enigma machine and how the British broke the code. So the following photographs are simplified directions on how the machine worked. And there's a picture of Guderian there in the field actually using one, which is very rare. Um, and it was explained to me with the three rotors, the three wheels that you see at the top, um, that, there were, that there were more possibilities for codes than grains of sand at the beach. So for me, that's what made what they did at Bletchley Park, with the help of the Polish and the French, of course, um, even more impressive that they were able to break that code. Um, on a side note, um, you're able to send mock messages and my four year old was playing with it and she sent me a note that said, daddy, I love you, which I thought was very cute. But the seven year old sent me a message that said, we attack at midnight. So if for whatever reason, if I can't finish this podcast, I'm going to pass the whole thing over to her. I think she's ready. Now, just to the right of the Enigma is the director's office, which must be really nice to be in charge of that place. And on the glass wall that you see here, there are etchings of planes in the clouds. I'm not sure if it's going to turn out on the picture. I hope it does. But that would be amazing to work there, to be in charge of that, and to see that view every day. Uh, and here is a picture of a Messerschmitt, sewing machine that is, which made many of the German uniforms before and during the war. And the last thing to see upstairs, besides some very impressive paintings of aircraft from World War I and World War II, which were done by pilots, uh, is a series of uniforms from World War II. Uh, this picture here shows the dress uniform of the Army Air Corps. This particular uniform was worn by Captain Dunbar Hughes, who flew in the Pacific. He sank a Japanese ship and then volunteered for the European theater. He was then part of the 8th Air Force 4th Fighter Group, and 335th Fighter Squadron. He was shot down in his P-51 over Germany on December 18, 1944, and he died in a German hospital on February 13, 1945, at the age of 23. Uh, as an example of how the U.S. had to play catch-up when entering World War I and World War II, the tunic that you see here is British-made. The second uniform on the right is of the actual U.S. Air Force when it separated and became its own separate branch in 1947. This uniform is from the Japanese Army from World War II, included as a winter flight suit, flight boots, and helmet. And though it's probably hard to see, there are a few magazine pictures at the very top. The next is a few Luftwaffe uniforms. From left to right, the first is a channel uniform when the uh, Battle of Britain was going on. The second one was mostly used for the Eastern Front. The third is a two-piece leather flying suit. The flight jacket's fur collar was recently replaced, they wanted you to know. Then there's the accompanying leather flying pants, molded after horse riding pants. And if you look really closely, you can see around the throat, the throat microphone and flying goggles. I hope that turned out. This one is a U.S. Navy full-length winter flight suit. It's pretty straightforward, but I imagine it got the job done as much as possible in keeping the pilots warm. This one is a Russian service dress tunic and pants with a pilot's cap. The rank is one of colonel. And, looking snazzy as ever, the uniform on the left is a British officer's service dress tunic. The pilot's wings are over the left pocket. There is also an officer's side cap and RAF wing and crown metal badges. To the right is a wartime officer's war service battle dress jacket and trousers. Again, the pilot's wings are over the left breast pocket. And hanging from the left pocket is an Acme Thunderer whistle. The belt is a 1937 pattern web belt with a 1943 holster and cartridge pouch. And you can also see a 1944 RAF life vest. And here is a pilot's uniform of the U.S. Army Air Corps. It's got a jacket and trousers, both made by Werber Sportswear Company. You can also see the flight boots and crusher cap. And at the bottom of the photo, you can see a Mark III aircraft IFF set used by the British and the Americans. And to keep it out of Axis hands, it had a small uh, TNT charge in it that could be used to destroy it if the plane was forced down. And lastly for the uniforms, here's a pilot's uniform from the U.S. Army Air Force. You can see the popular, even today, leather jacket or A2 jacket that's also known as a bomber's jacket. 
Now, this one particular, someone from the pilot support group uh, painted some artwork on the back. I hope the picture comes out. And on the left-hand side, you can see an electronically heated flying jacket and the tunic that belonged to you, Troy Bowers. Lieutenant Bowers served with the 394th Fighter Squadron of the 367th Fighter Group in the 9th Army Air Force in Europe. Bowers flew 68 combat missions from May 1944 to May 1945. At first he flew the P-38, but then his group switched to the P-47 Thunderbolt. He had two confirmed air victories and numerous ground kills. Okay, let's move on to the planes, which is probably what you wanted in the first place. Now, when you first walk in, like I said earlier, there are hangars to either side of the main room. If you go to your right, it's the Army hangar, and if you go to the left, it's the Navy hangar. And separate from this main room, there are at least two more hangars, a uh, World War I hangar, a World War II hangar, and then there's a hangar that uh, housed Jewish slave labor. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, that building was brought over from Germany after the war. Unfortunately, I did not get to spend too much time in the army hangar because we were about to go on the tour of these separate hangars. But that's okay, because I got to see a Spitfire. I didn't notice it at first, because the hangar is stuffed, and so you're pretty much standing in front of it right before you know what's going on. But then it dawned on me, and I just... I just stood there for a couple of moments, um, you know, realizing what it was. I had done so much reading and watched so many videos and DVDs and YouTubes. It truly felt like I was just coming back to an old, long-lost friend. I know that sounds totally corny, and I'm sorry, but it's true. I just stood there and just, and just gawked at it for a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm sure I looked very strange to everyone else. And I could just picture it sitting on a grassy field, waiting for the alarm to go off for someone to jump in and just take off into the sky. It was just, it was just a, a truly wonderful moment. Now, there was a guide in the hangar, but uh, he was off with another group. I just kind of walked in by myself. But I did hear him encourage everyone strongly not to touch anything. Uh, because in his words, if it could fly, it will leak and you'll end up with oil all over yourself. Uh, and sure enough, there were mats underneath most of the planes, you know, catching drops of uh, black oil. But I couldn't help myself. This was a spitfire. So when the man wasn't looking and he was very nice and answering all the questions, I ran my hands all over practically every inch of her that I could reach. Uh, there's no words. I just had to touch it. It was amazing. Except to say that um, I'm somehow going to break it to the wife that I either want my pilot license or I want someone to fly me one of these things. It has to happen. Okay, enough gushing. This particular Spitfire is a Vickers Supermarine Mark 1 XE. Uh, it has a Rolls Royce Merlin engine, of course, and it's capable, which is capable of uh, 1,760 horsepower. So its max speed is 312 miles per hour, and it has a ceiling, uh, maximum ceiling of 43,000 feet. It has two 50 caliber machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannons. And just to let you know how good uh, the Spitfire was, um, it was used by more than 36 countries for several decades after the war. And this particular Spitfire served in North Africa, Italy, Corsica, Greece, and Yugoslavia. It then went on to serve in Italy and Israel after the war. Hey everyone, Ray here. We've all been there. Seemingly out of nowhere, you get hit by an unexpected bill, and your world just stops. When that happens, you panic, so it's hard to think, what are my options? Well, that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart is here to help. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt or help you survive that unexpected bill with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. And just know, you are not alone. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers who are on their path to financial freedom with a fixed monthly payment, with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows that you are more than just your credit score, which is why they factor in your income, employment, and other information in your loan application. That's how they get you the best deal. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we, 
sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. Again, I didn't get to stay long in this hangar, uh, but here are some more pictures. Here's a Ryan PT-22 recruit. It was the first monoplane trainer used by the U.S. Army Corps. Uh, Before the U.S. entered the war, most of these Ryans were exported to the military of the Netherlands of the East Indies, which is modern-day Indonesia. And after the U.S. entered the war, they were mainly used as a reconnaissance plane. But because of their maximum speed of only 125 miles an hour, many were shot down and many pilots were lost. There was also a B. Mitchell bomber. Uh, I took as many pictures as I could, but it was hard to back up because there were so many planes surrounding you. Um, But if anybody listening is of suggestible age, you might want to have them turn away for a moment as I show you a picture that was painted on the other side of the cockpit. Um, War is all hell, but men are men. And uh, that's all I'll say on that one. Um, As we got the last call for the tour, um, it was only then that I noticed the Hawker hurricane. I felt horrible, even guilty, as I almost missed this thing. But uh, just a few quick facts. Uh, The Hawker hurricane was at first meant to be an updated monoplane, a mono version of the Hawker Fury. It first flew in 1935, and as we covered in the uh, podcast months ago, um, there were a lot more of them built than there were Spitfires. Uh, This particular hurricane was built in 1943 in Canada, and it's almost in its original condition. It has a max speed of 340 miles an hour and has 12 Browning 303s. Um, This aircraft's livery or paint scheme on it is that of pilot officer John Kenneth Haviland, who um, was the only U.S.-born RAF pilot to survive the Battle of Britain. He eventually returned to the U.S. and retired as Professor Emeritus from the University of Virginia, my stomping ground. And yes, I put my hands all over this beauty as well. In my haste, and I feel bad about this, I missed the P-51 Mustang and the Curtis P-40. Maybe I'll get that next time. So we all loaded up into our cars and drove the 30 seconds we needed to get to the first separate hangar. Uh, You can easily walk over there, but with two kids, you know, that's asking for trouble. So first we went to the fighter factory, which is where all their uh, maintenance is done. Now here, but I didn't know it at the time, I would get a second chance with a hurricane. So that was exciting. Um, because the actual work is done there, not only were we not allowed to touch anything, but we had to stay behind the yellow lines. So we pretty much spent uh, that tour on the very edges of the building, but it was still worth it. As you first walked in right there before us was a hurricane that was in for maintenance. Um, it turns out that this particular one was built in Canada and was used to shoot down balloons, carrying incendiary devices as the Japanese sent them over, knowing that they would be carried by the air currents, um, Um, hoping that the devices would make it that far, start forest fires, and then burn up um, factories or homes or cause mayhem and chaos. Um, So they would go around and just shoot those balloons whenever they could find them. And as these pictures show, it was nice to see the inside of one. And yes, when the guide wasn't looking, bless his soul, he had to be in his 80s, um, I did cross the line and pat the aircraft, thanking it for its contribution. Beside the hurricane was another V-1 flying bomb uh, that was waiting for an engine from Germany. Again, so there was no fuel and no explosives, so we all relaxed. Um, In front of the hurricane was a Corsair, which I recognized immediately, having watched every episode of Baba Black Sheep many times over as a kid. Pappy Boynton was my hero. Um, But of course, none of that compares to actually standing there and seeing it up close because it was on the edge of the yellow line. We got really close to it. It's a lot bigger than I imagined. And somehow it just radiates power and destructive force. It was was almost uh, intimidating in a way. Um, This Corsair had its wings folded up. But when they're down, the goal wing look really, really makes it easy to recognize. Um, The pilots called it a hose nose, but the Japanese dubbed it whistling death. When it first came out, it was meant to be used as a carrier-based fighter, but that didn't work out. But everything did work out as a ground-based fighter. This particular one was made in May of 1945 and spent much of its time in storage. It was made by Goodyear and has a Pratt & Whitney engine. It has a maximum speed of 425 miles per hour and a ceiling of 35,600 feet. Its armaments consist of six 
50 caliber machine guns, eight HVR rockets, and two 1,000-pound bombs. Whistling death, indeed. So then we left that hangar and then went to the Cottbus hangar. Now, this authentic German Luftwaffe hangar was relocated from the Cottbus Army Airfield in Cottbus, Germany, a small town southeast of Berlin. In 1933, the Cottbus Airfield was built along with a pilot flight school. Now, this particular hangar, Hangar 6, was built in 1934 by a German company that was founded by a World War I flying ace, Saxonberg, with his Navy friend. They formed the company to help former military personnel make the transition to civilian life. That's fine. However, Saxenberg lost control of the company in 1934 when he spoke out against the Nazi uprising in Germany, and it was discovered that he was of partial Jewish descent. The hangar was originally used to house aircraft for the flight school, but from 1941 to 44, it was used by the Falk Wolf Company for storage and a base for test flights, while manufacturing the FW-200 Condor and FW-190 fighter plane. Now, I should preface this next part by saying I haven't been to the Holocaust Museum yet. Um, in some ways, I'm still trying to work up... Um, being able to handle all that, but we got a, unexpectedly, we got a taste of it, uh, in this hangar that housed, um, Jewish slave labor. Um, on May 29th, 1944, the hangar was severely damaged during an eighth air force attack. Makeshift repairs were made quickly. And, um, it's believed that when those repairs were being made, that an individual, um, who, who was trapped in the hangar, um, scratched on one of the beams, um, that was supporting the uh, top left of the of the building, uh, and it's written in Polish, and it says, Anusia Wakla worked here, 10-14-1944. And uh, here's a couple of pictures of that. So it was just, um, I don't know, it was bold, it was brave, it was foolish all at the same time, but just knowing that someone who had gone through all that, it was forced to work, was forced to live in that thing and work and never leave, and it could be bombed at any time by the Allies, uh, just decided to have a moment of hubris or whatever and scratch that out and it wasn't um, discovered for a long time afterwards um moving on the guide explained to us that before the war germany of course was under a lot of restrictions as far as the types and numbers of uh, aircraft that they can have and of course they got around all this and the ability to test their aircraft by creating uh, flying sports clubs and the like um so this particular hangar is full of german aircraft and they're really all amazing um i think i've got pictures of everything so hopefully you'll see it in the next couple minutes um but if there was one aircraft that dominated the room, it was probably the JU, the Junkers 52, uh, mainly of its size. So here's a couple of fi pictures of that. Um, it was first flown in 1930, and its nickname was Iron Ann. Um, like most German aircraft, it was very reliable and durable. Uh, that is until the uh, enemy aircraft from the British and uh, later on in the Americans, their design got better and they got faster and they were easily able to keep up with this workhorse. Uh, this plane did do a lot for Germany. It served as a troop transport, uh, transporting cargo. It was a bomber. It was a paratroop plane. Uh, it was able to do a lot of things, but unfortunately it had a maximum speed of 165 miles an hour. And so the, the British uh, during the Battle of Britain were easily going to be able to keep up with it. Um, and after the Battle of Britain, easily able to keep up with it and uh, bring it down. Uh, after the war, Spain kept building them, uh, mainly due to it being su such a solid aircraft. And for years afterward, uh, many less developed countries used them as their main aircraft. This one here is the only flyable one in North America. And I think there's only about seven total around the world that are still flyable as far as that's, that's known. Now, next, and I have to confess, um, being in a weird way obsessed with this gun, since I first read the Arms of Krupp, uh, Germany's largest and best steel maker and arms manufacturer. Uh, this gun is the, um, was first, came, first came out in 1928. Um, it's the German 88 millimeter Flak 36. Um, they were built and designed and used to be anti-aircraft gun, but then uh, guns. But then someone decided, uh, like during the Spanish Civil War and later on, Rommel gets a lot of credit for this, to use it as an anti-tank weapon. And much to the horror of the British Commonwealth forces in North Africa, which we're about to read, he was able to mass them together and uh, just really do some serious damage to British ar armor. It has a range of 9.2 miles, and when a shell initially leaves its barrel, it's moving 2,624 feet per second. 
That's amazing. It could pierce the thickest armor from a tank, even though it's two miles away. Uh, our guide then told us that one of his friends who participated in D-Day uh, was coming ashore and he heard the distinctive sound of a German 88 and he knew he was in for a bad day. Uh, fortunately, he survived. Um, the 88 that you see here um, was on its way to North Africa when a British patrol chased it into Spanish waters. Um, so the British did not get it, but neither did Rommel. Uh, the Spanish kept all the guns they could get their hands on from the Germans, especially as the momentum of the war swung towards the Allies. Uh, here also is a picture of its controls for firing and a searchlight. And as you can see, uh, on one of the barrels, it had uh, three markings on it to let you know it at least shot down three planes. Then you come upon the Fizila FI-156. It was also called a Storch. Uh, it was mainly, mainly used as a liaison aircraft. It didn't need a lot of space to take off or land, and that made it very popular. Um, it only had a, an engine that was capable of 240 horsepower, and so its top speed was only 109 miles an hour. But the guy told us it was this type of plane that Hitler used um, to have a uh, special, I think it was a commando squad, go into Italy and rescue uh, Mussolini after he'd been arrested. So it brought him, uh, brought him back to Germany. And, of course, we all know it was for nothing, but this is the kind of plane that was used to get him out of uh, Italy very quickly. Next is the Falk Wolf FW-44J. It had several nicknames, but one of them was the Goldfinch. Now, this is a very solid flying plane. It was very popular before the war. It was very reliable, very dependable, and probably for that reason alone, um, every pilot in Germany who trained in the 1930s probably flew a version of this plane. And the one that you see here is the last version of the 44J. Now, the next plane that you're about to see is the BU-133C Jungmeister, which had to be the pride of Germany during the 1936 Olympics in Berlin because it won a gold medal for aerobatics. And you're probably not surprised to hear that in 1936, this was the only time that aerobatics was an event. Um, so the Germans have been practicing their civilian airmanship for years, and they wanted to show it off, and they got a chance. Um, and because the plane's superb handling, future Luftwaffe pilots would use this for, as a combat training aircraft. And its uh, maximum speed was 150 miles an hour. And then we left and we went to the last separate hangar, which is convenient because by now my little girls were wishing they could jump in one of these planes and fly back to the beach. Uh, they were getting pretty tired. Um, but just when I didn't think I could be any more amazed um, than the stuff I saw in the World War II um, hangar, uh, the World War I planes truly demonstrated how far and how fast aircraft development had improved from the Wright brothers to World War I and to World War II. And I'm not just talking about the engines. I'm talking about the material the planes were made out of, the things around the pilot, the technology. It, it was just amazing how we, you know, just like everything else humans do when they put their mind to it, um, the improvements just kept coming and it truly was amazing. One of the most amazing things I thought was when they finally figured out to get the timing right so the bullets would go in between the blades and not through the blades of the propeller. So that was that was pretty amazing, and he had a, a display there. I don't think I got a good picture of it, but I'll, I'll I'll put up what I do have. And just as a warning, I don't have the description on every plane, but I do have some very wide shots, so I'll show you those as well. Uh, the first plane that I saw was the Sopwith Strutter. Now, the Strutter was made by the same company, of course, that made the Sopwith Camel, which we all know about. And I believe the, the Camel is the one that Snoopy used to take on the Red Baron. But we'll get to that later. Uh, anyway, the Shutter was the first British fighter to enter World War I with a synchronized machine gun. So that obviously helped their uh, efficiency a lot. Um, it was used by the British, the French, the Americans, and others as a multi-purpose airplane. Some had one seat, some had two. Uh, the two-seaters had a movable Lewis gun facing the rear. Now, this particular one had a maximum of speed of 100 miles an hour and was first flown in 1915. The next was the uh, Sopwith Camel, but you can tell your children it's not the actual plane that Snoopy flew. Uh, just to let you know, when you first enter, when you first buy your ticket, if you look up, there is a Sopwith Camel there hanging upside down in the center, and they did put a Snoopy in the cockpit, so you can tell your kids that that's the one Snoopy flew, if you want. I'll leave that up to you. Hey everyone, Ray here. History is replete with humans overcoming adversity. Yet one of the most horrific disasters, and those that it affected has largely been forgotten, that being the great Mississippi Flood. 
From Wondery, American History Tellers is a podcast that explores extraordinary events from our nation's past and brings them to life. And the story of the Great Mississippi Flood launches their new season. In the summer of 1926, the American Midwest experienced rainfall like no one could remember. And all that water had to go somewhere, that being the mighty Mississippi. By the time the rain stopped, some 27,000 square miles were underwater. Crops were destroyed, getting around was practically impossible, and hundreds of farms and entire communities had been washed away. This included now 600,000 homeless Americans and another 1,000 dead. And when you add on the racism, exploitation, and betrayal that followed, the American landscape would be changed forever. Listen to American History Tellers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Anyway, getting back to reality, uh, the camel was more powerful and more heavily armored than the previous Sopwiths, and they shot down more enemy planes than any others for the Allies in World War I. Now, the day that the Red Baron, Baron Manfred von Richthofen, was shot down, he was in a duel with the Sopwith camel, but at the same time, he was taking fire from the ground. So, when he was finally shot down on that day, it's not really clear who deserves credit for that. I'm sure there's a big argument going on. I'm not going to get involved, but uh, between the um, the British gunner on the ground or who was ever flying the camel, um, somebody took the Red Baron down. And on a side note, the Baron ordered that his plane be painted bright red to intimidate his opponents, and uh, it worked for a while. Um, of course, the Red Baron's plane was the Fokker D7, um, but after World War I, most of the planes were destroyed on the orders of the victorious Allies. Uh, some were taken by them to be uh, studied and analyzed when they got back home. Now, this next plane really got uh, everybody's attention, the group that I was with. This is an Eli Curtis pusher, and it's called a pusher because the propeller is behind the pilot, so it pushes him or her through the air. Uh, it was first built in 1909, and incredibly, it was the first uh, aircraft to take off from a U.S. naval ship in Hampton Roads, Virginia, when Eugene Eli took off from the USS Birmingham on November 14, 1910. That's just amazing to me. Uh, the plane here is a slightly updated model because it came out in 1911. But of course, this is just a replica of that second version. And as you can imagine, this plane is the only flying replica in existence. But here's the amazing part. So the man, um, and I don't remember his name, uh, was asked by the Military Aviation Museum to build this. He lives in Ohio, so he built it and then he flew it here and landed in their in their own runway which is in incredible because you're looking at it there's barely anything to it in fact some of the gauges that you see here were not on the uh, 1911 airplane they had to be added on by the man in ohio to accommodate faa laws so those men in 1911 were very brave or crazy or both i don't know so it truly was uh, an amazing time of pioneering so here's just some water shots of what's in this hangar here. Um, but then I was able to talk my girls or basically bribe them in going back to the main building so I could go to the Navy hangar, which I totally missed um, the first time around. Um, so I did get to see a PBY Catalina. Uh, and during the war, practically every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces used these, mostly as anti-sub um, convoy escorts, cargo transports, and search and rescue planes. Um, and it's, it lasted in its military duty until the 1980s, which tells you how much of a solid plane it is. But even today, it's still used in uh, aerial firefighting. So here's a picture of me and my girls uh, before they totally broke down. Um, now, here's some of the other planes in the Navy hangar. And I saw I, I did not get to ask any questions. The guys were all taken up with someone else. They were starting to get busy. Still, this hangar, just like the other ones, was absolutely amazing. So that's the Military Aviation Museum in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It's definitely worth a visit, and the people there were incredibly friendly and knowledgeable. I will put all these pictures up on uh, Facebook for those of you who follow me on Facebook. Um, they have air shows every summer as well as um, different period parties and celebrations. You can check in on their uh, on their website. Um, 
what can I say? It was an amazing time for me and my family until the girls broke down. Um, and I came this close. You might have almost seen me on the news for trying to jump into one of the cockpits, probably the Spitfire or the Hurricane, and have my own imaginary battle with um, with the Red Baron, just like Snoopy did. So I, I was just so tempted. So uh, lastly, here are a few more photos just to fit in uh, that I think you'll really appreciate. Um, for you members out there, episode six is coming out soon. And this one is the first in a series of Dr. McIndoe and the Guinea pig club. Um, the pilots who were burned over the battle of Britain and after. So I'll get that out just as soon as I can. Um, before and I thought this was interesting. I just learned this before 1939, most people who um, were burned died because of shock, but through uh, the 1930s, the doctors stumbled upon bit by bit, uh, incrementally, uh, different ways to keep a, person who had burned um, alive for a little longer. They used to just die right away. But they, with, with saline and some other thing, things, they kept them alive longer and longer and longer. And so by the time mid-1940s come, these people are able to live through a burn. But what do you do with them now? So that's what we'll be exploring with Dr. McIndoe. So I'll get that out as soon as I can. And then a regular episode will come out where we get to the next part of Operation Compass, where General um, Richard O'Connor keeps pushing the Italians west. I'll get those out as soon as I possibly can. Um, sorry for the delay. I just took a couple days off with the family. So I will see everyone as soon as I can with that. Uh, take care, everyone. Oh, and one more thing. Um, I did find a, a few Audible books that connected with this trip. And as I show you a couple more pictures from the trip, I'll just, um, I'll just give these out to you. The first one is The Early History of the Airplane, written by Orville and Wilbur Wright. It's about their ex uh, experience with their first flight in December of 1903. All the work that went into it, all the testing they had to do, they had to figure things out as they were going. And then they would test all these theories uh, hundreds of times over with gliders before they had their 12-second uh, flight, which was, of course, the first flight of a um, self-propelled machine into the air carrying a man. So it was a pretty interesting story, and hopefully you'll find the whole story very exciting. It is, it is written and uh, presented to be entertaining and not just a bunch of facts and figures. The second book is called Spitfire Ace, and this uh, story really is a portrait of a few of the men who fought in the Battle of Britain. It talks about their experiences in the air and on the ground. And on the ground, it was all about organization and efficiency, which uh, loosened everything up that could then happen in the air. Because once you're in the air, it's all about teamwork, working with each other, communication, and of course, um, you working with your Spitfire and what it can do. And of course, a lot of courage. And there's also some interviews in there with, some, with a few of the pilots who fought and survived in the Battle of Britain. So I thought that was interesting. And the last one is called Finish 40 and Home. The Untold World War II Story of B-24s in the Pacific. This is the story about the 11th Bombardment Group, um, and it has everything in there. It goes into the author's father, who lied in, about his age to get into the Army Air Corps. He was only 16 at the time. It goes into all their training, what they had to prepare for, and then it gets them into the Pacific and some of their missions. And it really goes into detail how dangerous it was for these young men. I mean, they're flying over thousands of miles of water, no fighter protection, and there's nothing to confuse the uh, Japanese um, guns on the ground firing at them. So it was a very dangerous time. And as they got closer and closer to Japan, they start losing more and more of their men. In fact, um, between 1942 and 1943, um, one squadron loses roughly half of its men. Um, so it, it, they were getting closer to completing their mission, but at the same time, a lot more of them were dying. Um, and of course, they were all focused on doing their 40 missions and then getting home. 